Well, hello, welcome. Wheatfield, it is an honor to be here. If you are joining us online, I wanna say welcome to you. Hope you're having a great spring break this week. We'll see you next week, right? Also to the jail campus, I'm so grateful to be a part of the ministry directly there. And uh, I also want to, with, without further ado, also welcome the Hebron campus. Hey guys, my name is Noah and I get the privilege of being the worship director at the Hebron campus. And I'd love to share with you just a few quick facts about me. The first of which is the most important. I have a wife. Her name is Jenna, and she is beautiful. She is wonderful. She is my favorite person in the whole world. And as Pastor said, she is the operations director up at Hebron. And I just, I love living a life of ministry with her. As of Thursday this week, we celebrated four years of marriage. Yeah. Here's a little picture of our family. That's me. That's Jenna. This guy right here. That's Nacho, he is our dog. He is 12 years old now, which kind of makes him a grumpy old man. But look at that face. That's a good boy right there. I am uh, 27 years old now, and um, my Enneagram type is definitely a three. The last bit of trivia that you should know about me is that I have moved 26 times. 26 times, and yeah, I'm 27 years old, and I've already lived here for two of those years, so I'll let you do the math. Growing up, I was a military kid, and that meant hopping into new environments, making new friends, adjusting to different cultures, and I have something to say to all of you. This community, the people that represent Christ in the towns of Hebron and DeMott and Wheatfield, you guys are special. You guys are built different. The kind of generational community that exists here is truly unique. And um, I've lived a lot of places, but this is my favorite place to live. I actually love it here. And that's saying something because I used to live in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll tell you this right here, right now. Today, you heard it from me. I will take sweet corn over coconuts any day. But for real, I do believe that God is working in the heart of this community. And I'm just so thrilled to be a part of generations of disciples making generations of disciples. Amen? Amen. Well, today is my first time preaching. This is my third time now, I guess. Um, but I'm still just as nervous. I thought it would change a little bit, but I'm shaking. My mouth is really dry and my teeth are sticking to my lips and stuff like that. Um, so... If I could just ask uh, for two things from you. First, would you give me your ears? Uh, I really think that the story that I'd like to share with you is worth listening to, and I do think that it could be a catalyst for life change. The second thing, far more important than just listening, would you open up your hearts? Open up your hearts to what God has for you today. I believe that God has all of the conviction and all the grace that we need. I'd like to pray, and as we do, I wanna invite you to speak with God and say, Lord, feel free to change my heart today. Let's pray. Jesus, we are in awe of you. We have been blessed by you in ways we don't even deserve and cannot begin to recount. God, I ask for your presence to move in our hearts today. I ask that you would use me to communicate your greatness. Help my words to be clear to the ears that listen but more importantly, God, would you move and speak clearly to the hearts that are open? It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Question, question for you. Have you ever wondered what it takes to be a Christian? I know I have. Uh, just kidding. I haven't. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> Tied it into the series, yeah. As I said before, I grew up on the move, and that meant that... Um, uh, there were always boxes, like fully packed, labeled, taped up, ready to go, just waiting for the next truck. In fact, if you went to my house down in Alabama right now, I bet you you could go in the attic and still find boxes packed, labeled from before the year 2000, probably. Mom, Dad, if you're, if you're watching, I love you. You'll be ready for the next move, you know? But moving wasn't just about the boxes, right? It was actually a pretty crazy way to experience community. I mean, imagine trying to make a friend knowing that you're going to only see them for less than a year. It was difficult. And the friends that I did make, they weren't the lifelong kind of friends. Um, they, they, didn't, they weren't the friends that I would go to their house for Christmas or take a vacation with. In fact, I didn't have a lifetime kind of friend until much later in life. That being said, all that being said, I did really learn about Jesus. Um, 
I was always at church. Like my parents have to say thank you to that because every time the doors were open, we were there. In fact, church was the most consistent thing that I had in my life growing up. And I wanna give you a little picture of uh, what I was like as a kid. But before I do, I need you to know, I was the homeschool kid. Like the homeschool kid. Um, This is me. Obviously, I knew my mom was taking the picture at that point, so I could not smile out of uh, pros- pros- prosperity, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I was, I was that kid with the white button down, the red tie, the khaki pants, okay? And you don't see it in this picture, but listen, I had my elbow fully extended, barely touching the blue plastic chairs, just waiting to answer a question in Mr. Rush's Sunday school class. That was me. That was how I grew up. And uh, it didn't really matter where we were living. Um, it didn't even really matter what church we would go to. That's just how it was. And while I did learn about Jesus, who he was and what he did, I also learned something else. I learned how to act and I learned how to look. I learned how to copy and paste the Christian life onto myself. I learned how to play pretend Christian. And it was easy. Nobody really knew me, so I could, I could put up a front. But this guy, he had missed something. Despite all of the church experience I had, I had missed something very important. And this is my point for today. I'm about to give you the entire message wrapped up into one statement that you can take home with you, that you can put in your back pocket. And sometimes messages have like a big reveal to them or some sort of methodology. But today, I want to put it out front and we can all examine it together. I do think that this statement um, could be new for some of you. But I also think that it could serve as a beautiful, beautiful reminder. And here it is. Jesus wants you on his team. Jesus wants you on his team. And I have an important clarification. He wants your heart, not your game. And I do want to unpack this before you, but before we do, let's look at scripture. Paul says in Ephesians, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Before the world was ever made, God loved us. He chose us. And in Christ, we can be without fault. Man. I continued to grow up as typically everyone does. And I ended up getting to the eighth grade, started making friends. I would say this is the first friend group that I really do remember and cherish. And uh, all the guys that I made friends with were extremely athletic, like insanely athletic. Um, Some of them even went on to play like collegiate and professional sports. Um, But one guy out of the group was better than the rest. He was a top athlete. His name was Zach Steele. All right, listen, I'm going to say that name again so you understand the kind of athlete that this guy was. Zach Steele, right? He could run faster, jump higher, throw farther than anyone else. And the cool part about Zach was he was also one of my best friends. And we did everything together. In fact, my first time watching The Lord of the Rings was with this guy. And uh, we watched the extended editions, which if you don't know, in the L-O-T-R world, as they say, that's like 11 and a half hours of hobbits. We did everything together. Um, I remember this one time we went on his dad's boat uh, to go tubing. And this is not a good story, by the way, uh, because... Um, unlike our pastor, Zach's dad did not have an inboard direct drive open bow tournament certified American Water Ski Association record setting ski boat. And although my name is Noah, I actually have a lot, a lot of terrible boat fail stories. And this is one of them because we went out to the very middle of Lake Martin and that boat died. So we had to paddle it back, except we didn't have paddles. So we had to swim it all the way back. And it just got worse from there because when we did actually get back, we took the boat trailer and punched it through the tailgate on his dad's truck. Um, All that to say, (laughs) we were great friends. And one thing, there was one thing that I could always count on when it came to Zach and I's friendship is that no matter what, Zach and I would be on the same team. You see, Zach was always the captain. He was the best. And you know how you pick teams. You split the two best guys up and they start calling people out. They're like, I want you, I call you, I call you. Zach, without fail, would always choose me first. I call Noah. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense because I was not the best pick. There were plenty of other guys that would have been a better option than me. But still, Zach would choose me. 
Why? Because he wanted me. I wasn't the best, but he loved me anyways. I was valued regardless of my contribution. Zach picked me just the way that I was. Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced the feeling of being the person that someone wanted? Not too much time after Zach and I became friends, I would become a Christian, which is crazy to say because I, I grew up in church, right? But I'd only played the game. I hadn't actually given my heart to Christ. And looking back, my understanding of Jesus' love for me began with the way that Zach picked me. It began with the way that Zach loved me. You see, Jesus, he wants us on his team. And he wants us regardless of our ability. He wants us regardless of our contribution. And there's no audition. There's no trying out. Jesus doesn't love you because of your talent. He doesn't love you because of your position or your money. He doesn't love you because you're popular. He doesn't love you because of anything that you have, because he gave you everything that you have. And it says in our verse, even before God made the world, he loved us and chose us. Before the executive position at the law firm had ever been created, before American Idol would discover the greatest female country singer of all time, Jesus loved you and me. And the Bible talks about this in great detail. In Romans, it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Even though we weren't the best pick, even though we don't measure up. Jesus says in Luke, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I never had to try out to be on Zach's team. I didn't need to bring my game for him to pick me. He knew me and he knew who he was picking. He knew that I didn't measure up to the same athletic standard. And guys, here is the story of the day. And if you've fallen into one of those Sunday morning comas, I know, I've been there. Now is the time. Sit up, take a breath. Relax, open up those ears, because I'm actually uh, going to warn you, this, this story is crazy, legitimately crazy. I can remember Zach picking me for this big race. You see, both of us were in the same Boy Scout troop, and uh, that was the first year that our troop went to summer camp. The place name was Camp Thunder, and at the end of the week of activities, we did this big tournament Olympic-style um, set of games, like competing against the other troops. And there was tons of games, right? There was horseshoes, there was volleyball, there was ultimate frisbee, which you guys, I think, have heard a little bit of my skills there. Um, but the crowning race, the, crown, the, like, the piece de resistance of this camp was the great orienteering course. That's what they called it, the great orienteering course. And here's what it was. You would use a compass and you would have to find uh, waypoints somewhere on the property. And this race was one mile long. It featured four waypoints and four runners. And our job was to go and collect these flags and make it back to the finish line. And, you know, just as usual, Zach was the captain. And just as usual, he picked me first. And I was so new to Boy Scouts then that I didn't even know how to work a compass. Not only that, but out of the group of people that Zach picked, I was the slow boy. I, I could not keep up with them. But you guys need to know that Zach chose me because he loved me, not because I was good. So there was Zach, there was John, there was John's twin brother, Will. Both of those guys were crazy athletic too. Um, and we were getting lined up and Zach pulled us into a little huddle. And he's like, guys, I have an idea. I think if, if one of us takes the compass and sprints ahead to the waypoint, that we can use that time to get the bearing and then hand it off to the next guy with fresher legs to sprint to the next waypoint. Does that make sense? So we each divided up the waypoints. Um, I took waypoint number three, John took number two, Will took number four, and Zach took the first one. And so we're lined up, ready to go. They fired the cap gun and off goes Zach, probably faster than the bullet that doesn't exist in a cap gun. And um, we're all running after him, right? He's sprinting at full speed and there's just dust. Like, I, we can't keep up with this guy. And he gets to the first waypoint, he gets the bearing and here we come, he passes it off to John. John sprints ahead and he goes to the second waypoint and we're running behind him and guess what? Here comes the second waypoint. John's pointing in the direction that we need to go and I am gassed, okay? 
nothing left in the tank. I was done. My legs were butter, right? I'm burning on the inside. I can't breathe. My mouth is dry. The breakfast that I had was looking to come back. But worse than all of that was this thing, this thing that I had been running with in my own mind for the past half mile. So we're approaching and John starts running along beside us, right? And he's got the compass and he's doing the old like uh, Olympic style torch passing off, kind of like a relay race to me. And he's trying to hand it to me and I'm like, ah, guys, I can't use a compass. And without a second of hesitation, Zach grabbed it and he says, don't worry, I'll go. And he took off, running to the next waypoint. In that moment, Zach covered for my failures, shortcomings. Guys, we, we finished that race. Exhausted. I mean, I was exhausted. Zach was fine. Um, we finished first, victorious. We won that race. We were the first team to make it back. Not only that, but we set a camp record. For 63 years, no team had ever completed the course this quickly. We finished a mile-long orienteering course in five minutes and 36 seconds. Crazy, right? It felt awesome then. But looking back now, I realized that Zach had successfully sprinted half a mile on his own, mostly uphill in a Georgia summer. Not only that, but when it came down to my part, he ran my leg of the race. He picked me even though I wasn't the best for the team. He chose me when I wasn't the best and then ran my leg of the race. Listen. He chose me before the race ever started, before I ever failed him, fully knowing who I was. And then he covered for me when I couldn't run anymore. On top of all of that, you know what happened at the end of that race? We crossed the finish line and we celebrated. Zach came to me and he was like, that was awesome. Great job, church, listen on a much, much, much bigger scale. Jesus has done that for us. He's the captain who always calls us. And then he did all of the work for us by going to the cross on our behalf. And when we put our faith in him, he rejoices, he celebrates. I asked at the beginning, what, what does it take to be a Christian? Well, it takes Jesus. It takes his righteousness to pay for my unrighteousness. It takes his love to forgive my failures. It takes his death to give me life. Why? Why would Jesus do all of that? It's simple. It's because he wants us on his team. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So what do we do with that? What should we do with this? I think there's two implications that we can do with this. The first is to give him your heart, not your game. Give him your heart, not your game. The game I played growing up, it was so easy. It was so easy to pretend to be a Christian. I had everyone fooled, but the game, it didn't satisfy. I felt empty, sick even. And Zach was one of the people that God used in my life to demonstrate the kind of love that he has for me, the kind that forgives my failures, the kind that pushes me to greater things. And to stop playing the game and to give Jesus my heart, I needed that kind of love. I wonder how many of us have been playing the Christian game without actually giving Jesus our whole heart. Maybe you need Jesus to run your leg of the race. Maybe you've been struggling to keep everything together. Maybe you've been struggling to stop making bad choices. Maybe you don't think you need any help, but you really do. Maybe Jesus is calling you to his team, but you're just being stubborn. I wonder how many of us are there. I wonder how many of us are struggling to figure things out on our own, trying to run an orienteering course without knowing how to use a compass. 
If that's you today, there's, there's an easy pathway to follow. Just grab one of those blue cards. You're probably sitting on it. Fill it out during this next song. There's an entire team, a family, a community of people who are so willing and ready and excited to walk with you across the line of faith. And there's two implications, right? Not only do we need to give him our heart, but guys, we need to run the race. We need to run the race. The fact is, I ran the best race of my life that day. Zach pushed me to be a better athlete than I ever thought I could be. Have you ever thought about what God could do in and through you simply because you're willing? I could have quit. I could have compared myself to the other athletes and said, ah, I don't even have a chance. I could have stopped running when my legs were literally on fire. I could have thrown up my hands when I realized and the team realized I didn't know how to use a compass. But something kept me from doing that. Something that I hadn't experienced in that way before. On that day, in that moment, for those five minutes of exertion, Zach represented the kind of leader that I could follow the kind of leader that I wanted to follow, the kind of person that I want to be. And so, just for the few minutes that we have left, I wanna be a Zach Steele for you. I wanna call you to the race. I wanna choose you for the team. I want you to be a part of something that matters now and in eternity. And there's lots of ways that we could do that, but I think one of them is to join a serving team. It could be the usher team or the greeting team, the cleaning team, maybe even the production team, or, or hear me out, the worship team. If you are a drummer and you happen to live anywhere near Hebron, there's a place. Grab that card, fill it out during the next song. Check the little box that says you'd like to volunteer. One of the values that we share as a church, it's written on the walls out in the lobby. It says, save people, serve people. This is a way that we find community. This is a way that we build community. We're called to Jesus's team. It's, it's why we put our hands in and team it up at the end of every service. And I don't know, I don't know. Maybe some of you are already on a serving team and that's awesome but maybe it's just a thing that you do and then you go home without taking advantage of the community that God has given you, without doing life with the other people on the team. And if that's you, I just wanna call you to get involved. I experienced Jesus's love when my friend Zach picked me. When he valued me, when he chose me, it made me feel awesome and it pushed me to run the best race of my life. And I believe that Jesus is always calling us to himself. He cares about us. He wants a relationship with us. He paid the debt we owe. He ran to the cross on our behalf. And now he's victorious over sin and death and he's calling us to his team. If you want that kind of friend, if you want that kind of leader, if you need that kind of forgiveness, if you wanna live a life with a purpose that never fades, Run the race. We wanna be a church that looks to God for heart transformation, not just habit changes. And I encourage you, pull, pull out one of those cards. Take the step that God is calling you to do today. But hear me, don't be stubborn. I've played the game before. I've walked into church, sat down, listened to a cool story, saw some great points and walked out the same way that I came in. Following Jesus will push you further than you ever thought you could go. And we say this all the time, nobody's perfect and everyone is welcome. Because Jesus wants us on his team. So give him your heart and run the race. Church, I wanna invite you to stand. I'm gonna pray and then we'll sing one more song. Jesus, you deserve all of the glory and all the honor. And Jesus, we know you are calling us to yourself. You've made a way for us to be made right. You've given us a design for life and, I, and a charge to love you and love others. 
I ask that you would change our hearts today. I pray that you would take our willingness to join your team and turn it into greatness for your glory and your honor. God, I lift up the people hearing these words to you and entrust them to your care. God, I ask that you would provide for them and watch over them. Please give us the conviction where we need conviction and grace where we need grace. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this last song together.